the more we're kind of giving them a sense of entitlement and a sense of ease of declaring states of emergencies when they may not actually be states of emergencies and suspending civil liberties when they may not actually have to suspend civil liberties. And mm. also we're, we're sort of conditioning Australians mm. to get used to that kind of thing. And that, that's something we should not get used to. All right, I'm really excited to have Dr. Stephen Shavura here. Um, and can you please explain exactly who you are and what you do so the audience knows? Oh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm, a, I'm a historian of oh, a few things, early modern England, a historian of Australian uh, society and politics and Australian intellectual history. I've lectured at several universities in Sydney over the last now 20 years. And I'm currently senior lecturer in history at Campion College in Sydney. And I also like to travel to conferences and, and talk there where when, when I'm invited and when I can, I do social commentary and write for the odd uh, paper like the Specky Australia or the Australian newspaper. Oh, perfect. So we can follow your work on the spectator. So that's great. Um, so as a historian and a, and a, and a teacher, um, I'm going, to, I'm going to come straight out and ask a difficult kind of question. Mm -hmm. What do you think people will read about in 50 or 100 years' time about this particular time, the last two years in Australia? What do you think that they're going to read? Wow, that, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, I, I think people will look back on this period in Australia and I think that they'll say that Australia got caught up in a movement that the whole world got caught up in at the time. We sort of got sort of caught in the tide of, of a great panic uh, about COVID made possible by social media, made possible uh, by misinformation in the early days of the pandemic, and made possible uh, just by a kind of uh, global group dynamic of fear and panic and made possible also by the state of modern communications and surveillance technology, which led Australia, uh, like many other countries around the world, although none quite as draconian as Australia, to declare an emergency and to essentially essentially leading us to pass through a what, what I might call something like a, a kind of authoritarian, totalitarian moment. Uh, how long this will last is really anyone's guess. Um, I also think that, you know, what may be coming is that Australia, like many other Western nations, uh, becomes far more therapeutic in its public policy and that regular vaccinations and tracking uh, becomes a norm to the point where we just get used to it and don't even notice it anymore. But yeah, I think in 50 years time, people will look back on Australia and just kind of like World War I, how we sort of got caught up in a tremendous sort of global group dynamic. They'll look back on this and say the same kind of thing um, and that, again, that, that we had something like a, an authoritarian, totalitarian moment. And I say moment because, in all fairness, I don't know how long this is going to last. I don't know how much worse it's going to get. And I have to be honest about that. But I, I do strongly think that the last 18 months, and particularly the last um, six months, uh, Australia was plunged into a kind of therapeutic, authoritarian, totalitarianism. Um, yeah. yeah, that's what it feels like here in Victoria. And I hope, I hope that you're correct about the whole moment thing, because, uh, of course, you've heard about the permanent pandemic legislation that Daniel Andrews is, is putting together. Yeah. Um, if this goes through, I mean, Victoria is going to be more or less under a dictatorship. Um, where do you think that will leave the history books if that goes through well again a lot of that depends on how they use uh, their state of emergency powers uh, 
Um, and this is the difficult thing. Once you sort of get everyone to comply with the rules and they basically modify their lives accordingly, very often they just don't feel like they're under a, a sort of authoritarian dictatorship anymore because they've so modified themselves that they're so sort of internally disciplined themselves, if I can use that expression, that weirdly they feel free, even when in actual fact they're under a, a kind of a, a really a dictatorship. And, and I mean a dictatorship. I, um, you know, I mean, that word sort of goes back to the ancient Roman Republic. And uh, so in the ancient Roman Republic, generally speaking, laws were made through a kind of dialogue between the popular assembly uh, working uh, uh, with all sorts of office bearers and, 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 and the Senate and, and consuls. So power was sort of dispersed pretty broadly. But in times of emergency, what the Romans would do is, and they did this, gosh, maybe 80 or 90 times. I can't remember the exact number, but in times of emergency, so if they were being invaded, for example, by Hannibal, or if they were going through a famine, they would sort of suspend the Republican constitution and they would institute what they called a dictator. And the dictator was only allowed to be a dictator for six months. And the dictator could basically just declare law and declare policy to efficiently meet uh, whatever challenge was being faced. Um, and so the, the real question is how prepared not just the Dan Andrews government, but, but, but future governments will be to declare states of emergency in Victoria. And a lot of that will depend on the future of the, the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, will it mutate into other really serious uh, forms? Uh, will there be a kind of a sort of state relapse into COVID when the vaccines wear off? Uh, these are sort of unknown questions. Then the next question is, these, these sort of emergency laws, will they kind of soften Victorians and will they soften Australians for different kinds of states of emergency to be declared in the future? For example, it's becoming very common now, Monica, to refer to our climate emergency. Now, to, to keep talking about a climate emergency, and I don't think we're in a climate emergency, um, which isn't to deny climate change, but you know, there's a big difference between saying we're in an emergency and the world is on fire to, <laughs> well, yeah, actually, probably the climate is changing, um, which is nothing new. Uh, but the, the problem is that when you start invoking the language of emergency, you basically invoke a language which is very easily used to stifle debate mm -hmm. because an emergency by definition is almost something where you have to, you, you can't debate and talk, you have to act. And it's also something that is used historically, certainly in ancient Roman times and throughout history to suspend civil liberties in the name of overcoming this emergency. And so the question that you ask of sort of how long this totalitarian moment will, 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 will take in Australia, a lot of that depends on the willingness of governments to invoke these um, dictatorial powers. And that will depend on, on where the virus goes in the future. And it'll also depend on the extent to which they're able to uh, cultivate enough fear among enough people to be able to invoke these kinds of powers in the name of other kinds of emergencies. And the only other one I can really think of right now would be a climate, a climate one. Um, and so look, I mean, there's the old saying, you know, those who don't know the past, uh, uh, you know, will not know the future. Well, I mean, history doesn't really give us a, a really clear insight into the future, but it allows us sort of to dimly see what, what, may happen. And with all those variables I've mentioned, it, it is entirely plausible that, that this totalitarian moment either could last uh, for another few years, or um, it, could, it could sort of lapse, but then come back, uh, given the future trajectory of the, the, the virus, or be invoked for other so-called emergencies. And, and my, my issue, Monica, is that the more power that we give governments to do these kinds of things, the more we're kind of giving them a sense of entitlement and a sense of ease of declaring states of emergencies when they may not actually be states of emergencies and suspending civil liberties when they may not actually have to suspend civil liberties. Mm -hmm. And also we're, we're sort of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, we're kind of um, 
conditioning Australians mm. to get used to that kind of thing. And that, that's something we should not get used to. That's very concerning. Um, obviously, you know, coming up to the next federal election, um, if things don't change in a big way, you know, maybe Australians like dictatorships, you know, maybe they like being controlled. Some people do. Um, look, it's interesting you talk about the state of emergency and how long it's gone for, because um, in this situation, they've declared a state of emergency in Victoria for, you know, almost two years now. And, you know, the death toll is not that of an emergency um, when you compare it to other years of just regular death of the flu and other things like that. So it's very concerning that they could just keep calling emergencies for probably no reason, um, especially with this permanent pandemic bill. I'm basically just agreeing with you, I guess. Um, do you think Australians as a culture, do you think we don't mind being controlled? Do you think we're like kind of okay with it? I don't think Australians would like the language of being controlled. So if you went to the average Australian and said, do you like being controlled? They would say, absolutely not. And Australians historically, this is the way I would put it. I mean, short answer to your question is, is no, I don't think Australians like to be controlled, but, but what Australians do like is for governments to solve our problems and that inevitably means that governments will intervene more in our lives than if uh, we kind of try to solve our problems ourselves through personal responsibility. So do Australians like to be controlled? I would say no. Do Australians like government intervening in society to make our life, to, to give us all sorts of services and solve all sorts of problems? Yes. And does the latter make it more likely that in, in, in certain circumstances we can be controlled? Yes. And we're going through that right now in Australia. Um, Australia is a kind of unique country. You know, Australia, of course, start, starts as, as a you know, European Australia, I should say, starts as a convict colony. So deep in our history, there is control. You know, we were, we were a prison. Um, but the other thing in Australia, we're used to sort of government involvement in our society to to improve our society and to fix problems is that you know Austra the Australian landmass is huge and what that meant was is that we, ha we had a, we for a long time and still today have a very small population globally relatively to, gl to global populations and it means that very often governments rather than private enterprises have to step in and set up all sorts of services that markets themselves couldn't provide and so, for example, in England in the 19th century, in America in the 19th century, there, there were enough people in those countries and, and sort of clustered together enough for private entrepreneurs to build railway systems for a profit. But in Australia during that period, our population was very small and it was sparsely populated. Mm. And so there was really no market opportunity for railways. But we needed railways uh, for trade throughout Australia. And so naturally what happened is colonial governments stepped in and you had governments uh, starting railways. You had governments building churches. You had governments starting up all sorts of telecommunication systems when the technology came for that sort of thing. So in Australia, because of our geography, because of our history, we're actually used to governments doing things for us. And that can be good when it works, but it also runs the risk of just creating a mentality among Australians that if there's a problem, the first institution that needs to fix it is government. And government by definition is a coercive institution. So the political science textbook of a government is that, is that collection of, of, of that, that institution that has the, le the legitimate monopoly on violence. And so when governments do things, you can't just opt out of what they want to do. You, you have to go along with it. And, and so do Australians like being controlled? No. Um, but do Australians find themselves in positions where very often they're very vulnerable to governments overstepping their bounds and winding up controlling us? Well, yes, and I do think that that's something we're going through now. But also, Monica, historically, many people have written on 
on this this tension in our lives between freedom and security, mm. particularly in the mid 20th century with the right when you had the rise of totalitarian governments prior to and, and during World War Two, many social theorists got together and said, you know, what sort of made this possible? And and and, and one of them was was basically many of them basically said, look, freedom, it sounds really good, but a lot of people don't want freedom because freedom means they have to take responsibility for their own lives. And what they'd actually rather do is someone tell them what to do. And, and, and like the micro example of this, Monica, is sort of when you, when you say to someone, hey, do you want to go out to eat? And they say, yeah. And you say, right, what do you, what, where do you want to go? And they're just like, oh, I can't decide. I don't want to have to be the one who, who makes this decision. I could get it wrong. You do it. And there's a kind of a human propensity uh, for us to be like that in many circumstances. And, and so in Australia, what we may have gone through right now is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a period of, of, of intense kind of fear about COVID, which has led us to very easily give governments the right to control us, uh, to, to try to fix the problem. Um, maybe because we, we don't trust ourselves to be able to uh, behave in such a way that we can get through this without great catastrophe. Um, yes. It's kind like, of text, textbook dictatorship really to create, well, to perpetuate a problem and then be the, be the solution as well. So it's, it's a perfect storm for that. Well, um, I, I think, can I just say one more thing, Monica? Sure you can. Uh, like, I mean, you, you were talking about whether or not this is truly an emergency before, and, and I think it has to be s stated that, I mean, for me, I, I do think COVID, you know, is a serious thing. I mean, uh, you know, 700,000 people in America at least have, di have died from it. Now, I'll be also the first to say, I do actually think there were some serious issues uh, in reporting COVID deaths in terms of people dying with COVID and people dying from COVID. So I totally believe that. But I would just want to further, uh, nothing that I've said, is, it, it means to suggest that COVID isn't real, that COVID isn't serious. But whether it's a national emergency or not, that is something that I'm much more skeptical about, particularly given uh, the fact that, you know, the average age, I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is maybe in some ways that the very easy thing to do and the thing to do that that maybe for many politicians and 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 health bureaucrats to do was just to shut everything down to and to use a very sort of blanket blunt measure to try to avoid as many deaths as possible because no one wants to be held responsible for deaths no one wants to be held responsible for deaths and, and it's always easier to say look the economy may have taken a hit, but at least we saved lives rather than, hey, we lost lives, but the economy's doing well. Like no one's going to accept the latter. And so it seems to me just in human psychology and, and political dynamics, leaders opted for sort of politically and in some ways, maybe medically, it's sort of the, the, the safest option, but forgetting that, that there were other alternatives that, that that um that could have been pursued but maybe politically weren't all that expedient and, and we, we we learned very early on monica who was absolutely most susceptible to winding up in hospital from covid and in terms of stats well we know now that 79 percent of all covid cases 79 percent uh, were people uh, under the age of 50 and the and 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 people less than uh, people you know around about the age of 50 had a 0.04 fatality rate so very very small if you're 40 or, or, or around there 0.02 fatality rate tiny if you're 30 0.01 if you're 20 or younger 0.004 so the fatality rates of people sort of 50 and younger are vanishingly small. If you're younger than 10 years old in, in Australia, we had 23,000 children, 10 or under, who got COVID. Not one of them died. Um, the overwhelming majority of fatalities are basically people from 70 upwards. Now, that, that's not me saying, who cares about the people from 70 up? That's me saying, we know those who are most likely to get COVID and possibly overwhelm the hospital system. So let's focus on them. Let's focus on targeted lockdowns and quarantines for those very vulnerable people. Let's roll out the vaccinations and make sure that those most likely to overwhelm the hospital system get vaccinated and let everyone else pretty much get on with life as normal. But we didn't do that. And my, well, fear, yeah. and my fear is that Australians will just get used to that kind of policy. But, you know, how about this scenario? How about if our government 
informed us really well, informed the 70 plus year olds about the pros and the cons of taking a vaccination and how it would help or how it might cause injuries or whatever. How about they just educated us on hygiene and vitamin D and, you know, the things that make you healthy as opposed to locking you in your house. Well, how do you think Australians would have reacted if we just had a massive education campaign? Do you think we would have done the right thing and kept each other safe in that scenario? You know, I, I think that actually could have worked. Uh, the, the problem is just very early on in, in the whole the COVID saga, we got very high numbers of fatality rates from the World Health Organization. We're hearing, you know, 3% fatality rate, three in 100 people. It's, it's just nowhere near that. Um, we, we, we saw images from Italy of, of elderly people mm. dying uh, in their thousands. We saw images of China and we heard reports in China of bodies piling upon, upon bodies. And so the thing that really corrupted a, a, a kind of cool public understanding of what was going on was sort of the very early images and, and information and misinformation coming out of China, coming from the World Health Organization, coming from Italy, where we just weren't entirely sure what was going on. And I think it probably is the case that in actual fact, people would have been open to a, a more sort of pinpoint uh, way of, of dealing with COVID. And if we saw that it, it wasn't working, then you could gradually sort of expand um, the restrictions. But like many countries, we, we, we got quite caught up in a, a kind of fear pandemic. But the other thing, Monica, about Australia is Australia is not used to not being in control. And, and, and the perfect example is our borders. Now, I'm a great believer in strong border security, but the difference between Australia and many other countries around the world is that Australia has natural borders. We've got salt water around us. So we've got a pretty good control on who comes into Australia. European countries don't have that. Many other countries on, on larger continents don't have that, and they have all sorts of border problems. And so in Australia, we're kind of used to being in control of what comes into our country. We've got incredibly strict quarantine laws, probably the strictest quarantine laws in the world. And so when COVID hit Australia, I think we were probably uniquely prone to panicking because it was a very rare occasion in our national life where we, we, we didn't feel that we had control. So I think, I think that's probably another dynamic that fed into us. And, and this, is, this is not, I'm a, I'm a firm rejecter of the idea that we should have just let it rip and let it do what it's going to do. I reject that now, I rejected it back then, but what I've always been a proponent of is, is very, very thoughtful policy based on who we know is most likely to succumb to COVID and who we know is most likely to overwhelm the hospital system. But also, and this is where I think we really lapsed, we had a year between the last lockdown in, in New South Wales and the next one that we've just sort of finished. That doesn't seem to be, I mean, why in that year weren't the hospital systems expanded to the point where we wouldn't have to lock down the economy again, lock people in the houses again for four months? Uh, for fear of overwhelming the hospital system. Um, I, I just think there are a lot of unanswered questions that, yeah. that I hope in the coming, I think it'll be years, get answered, to be honest. I hope so too. I mean, what if our government, and I know I'm asking a bit much of a, of a government, but if, if, the, if after the an initial panic and then they saw the statistics of the fact that most of the people dying are actually at their life expectancy anyway, um, et cetera, et cetera. Let's let the young people keep the economy going and protect the most vulnerable. You know, why couldn't they just turn around and say, oh, sorry, guys, we panicked a little bit. Um, don't worry, we're going to adjust our plan a little bit. Instead, they just doubled down. Now, do you think that's them just not wanting to admit that they were wrong? Or do you think they used COVID as a chance to to um, deploy the dictatorship dreams. I I'm not sure. You know, the, we, we don't really know why the government is hiding information, censoring data, not showing us the proof of why playgrounds should shut down or why sports should stop or why we can't go to bars, but we can go here. I mean, the rules make no sense, okay? That's, that's clear in Victoria, really clear. Um, you know, just last week, we had people going to the Melbourne Cup, 50,000 people. They say because they're all vaccinated, but obviously there's a lot of proof out there to say that vaccinated people, you know, actually can um, share it just as much. So why... Do you think that do you think that they've got some sort of sinister plan, or do you think they really just don't want to say that they were wrong? Well, I, I, 
I, I think what it is, is naturally uh, politicians and political parties don't want to say that they got something wrong because then that will be exploited by the opposition party to have to, to kick them out of, of parliament, kick them out of power. At the end of the day, you know, I mean, I, I believe in, in the political system. Um, I, I do. Um, but at the end of the day, politicians, as cynical as this sounds, are to a large extent in the business of getting reelected. Mm. And so you, you can't just say to the country, oh, sorry, guys, we probably we overreacted there. Um, we won't do that again. And think that the, 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 the opposition government isn't going to try to make mincemeat of you at the next election for that. It'll be run by a hostile media. It'll be run uh, in, um, by the, 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 the other political party. Look, in, in all honesty, um, I, I think to a large extent, politics, public policy and legislation is 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 pushed along by very very big forces that that not necessarily any individual is necessarily behind i know in our minds it's it's very easy to sort of think that a lot of bad laws are because of sort of conniving individuals who who just want to have power over a whole population um, for evil reasons but very often what it is, is is a group of people who for some reason or another think that they're doing the right thing and they think that the best thing for everyone is to be controlled in such a way to avoid some sort of disaster and i think that's probably more what's happening and so which still means you can pass through a totalitarian authoritarian moment but but i think in many ways monica i think what's lurking behind a lot of this is that a lot of australians and 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 healthcare um, bureaucrats, technocrats, really do. They won't admit it, but they really, they really want COVID zero. I, I think, I think when politicians and technocrats started aiming for COVID zero, I really think they let the cat out of the bag early on. When, when th that what they really, really wanted was not to be able to, not to have to live with COVID, but to absolutely stamp it out. And. I think anyone who, who was sort of realistic at the time could sort of put two and two together and sort of say, wait, that doesn't make sense. Because on the one hand, you guys have told us that COVID is super, super, super contagious. But on the other hand, you're telling us that you want to eliminate it, annihilate it, stamp it out. That doesn't make any sense unless you're going to totally close the borders indefinitely. There's just going to come a point where we're going to have to live with it. And, and I think actually that's what's behind a lot of what's happened, that, that the Australian many in Australia, the Australian psyche or something, actually will not be satisfied knowing that there are still COVID cases in Australia and health bureaucrats will not be satisfied knowing there are COVID cases in Australia. And so I think the, the, the kind of longing for COVID zero, which, I, which is still with us, but I think that's what plunged us into this political and social problem that we're in. And, and we know that the, the longing for COVID zero is still with us because the New South Wales health minister was sort of gloat that was sort of um, celebrating the fact that it, would, it looks like 95% of New South Welsh people are going to get double vaxxed, but then sort of bemoaning the fact that 5% of New South Welsh people were not going to be vaccinated, even though you know, just months ago, we're, what we were really hoping for was 80% uh, double vaxxed. Yeah. And so I think, I think underneath all of this, even though a lot of people won't admit it, uh, is not so much directly a, a sort of a, 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 a want to, to grab power for the sake of power. I, I think it's this, this intolerance for any presence of COVID in the population. And that's what's leading them to make these power grabs. And I will say that when these power grabs are made, they can become addictive because these people often yes. really think they're doing wonderful things for, the, for society because they're really only thinking in terms of biological health. And that's, if I can just say this one more thing, Monica, one of the, the problems in the way that we've been thinking about this, not just in Australia, but around the world, is thinking about how we deal with COVID purely from a health perspective purely from a sort of biological health perspective, losing, losing uh, consciousness of the fact that we are not just biological creatures, we are also relational creatures, we are also economic creatures. And these are other parts of what it is to be a human being. And they're just, we haven't pursued COVID in a, in a, in a balanced way, we've pursued it 
purely from a biological health perspective. And when you say you when you talk to a health technocrat and say, right, what do we need to do? Well, the health technocrat technocrat is not an economist. The health technocrat is not a constitutional scholar or someone who understands necessarily the importance of, of liberties. They are also not someone who understands uh, necessarily at a professional level the importance of relationships. The biological health expert will tell you what needs to be done to, cont- to solve this from a biological health point of view. And the problem is that we forgot that there are other issues that also need to be taken into account. So we, we, we forgot the full aspect of what it is to flourish as a human being we focus solely on on the biological health and that's partly why we wound up with these incredible restrictions on our liberties many of which I just have no doubt were were unnecessary well you know even if let's just say that they were focused on biological um, they still failed in in my opinion and that is because they've they've blocked any sort of early treatment Um, they haven't done any education campaigns about how vitamin D actually acts as a moat around a castle almost, and it and actually would minimize hospitalizations like on a really high scale and um, ultra, ultravenous um, vitamin D will actually can, can cure a bad flu within a few hours and a lot of other things as well. So I, I find it hard to imagine that because I mean, you, sorry, you also mentioned the statistics about people under 50 dying from COVID. And um, in, the, in the whole of Australia during COVID, five people under 50 have died from COVID. And, and we don't even know if that's with or from COVID either. So depending on the five actually being true, it's not a national emergency either. So even if it's just biological, it doesn't make sense why they're hiding information and why they're blocking uh, treatment and things like that. So it seems impossible for, for me to imagine that there isn't some sort of sinister Thing, and it could just be money. It could just be pharmaceutical money. Um, you know, obviously, if you get boosters every twice a year, you're basically a constant client of the pharmaceutical industry. So it could, it could just be that simple. Could not. It might not be a power grab or some sort of sinister thing. Um, and look, a, a, I, I, will say, yeah. I think there is a power grab, not necessarily just for the sake of power. And, and look, I couldn't deny what you're saying. You know, you know, there could be a, you know, big pharma could have something to do with this. Political scientists all the time talk about corporate interests on, on, over governments. And we can't just stop talking about that now during COVID uh, because it's unfashionable. So I, I, would, I would go along with you in, there and say what you're saying there, Monica, is very plausible. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think Scott Morrison has bought 120 million doses. I mean, Pfizer, the, these personal boosters. Yeah, yeah. no, they, these companies have actually never had so much income in their entire history of, of being a business. I mean, it's like uh, it's Christmas every day for them. So it's and it's it's interesting because um, the one company uh, it, it rhymes with Isa. Um, they they have the biggest criminal payout in the history of criminal payouts. And then now everyone's like, oh, let's just get 95% of the population on this stuff because, yeah. you know, it's such a credible company with such credible history and yeah. well, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. Political scientists talk about what's called the military industrial complex, where a, a massive aspect of the American economy and, and, and is basically driven by the, the revenue generated by creating arms and and, 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 and the economic re- reliance on a huge army. Uh, so, you know, the idea that, that whole governments couldn't be uh, swayed by all sorts of different industrial uh, corporation complexes is, is very naive. And, and political scientists and historians and sociologists talk about this sort of thing all the time. Uh, there's yeah. nothing new about it. Yeah. And they're talking about the impact of big pharma on, on, on government, particularly American government, years before COVID came along. And I, th- I think it's very interesting that now many, particularly on the left, who years ago would have been talking about the pernicious influence of big pharma, the military industrial complex and just corporations in general, uh, are now very skittish about suggesting that maybe to some extent uh, public policy is somehow being skewed by pressure and by interests of of pharmaceutical companies. And that's not a conspiracy theory. That's kind of something just grounded in political sociology. 
yeah, and if it's happened before, you can't deny it can happen again. And I, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, I know this interview is going longer, but it's, I'm having a great time. Uh, the, the contract between Pfizer and um, the government, um, no one has seen that. Um, and so, uh, a, a member of parliament in Romania asked for it and 99% of the contract was redacted. So literally no one has seen the contracts between Pfizer and the government. And so it seems like transparency has become a thing of the past. Um, and, you know, I'll ask you about Scott Morrison. Um, he, he, he's kind of been a really interesting character through this because the states obviously have their own ability to make laws and things like that. But he could, of course, impact on that by by um, by what he says in the media or by by what he does in general. And Victorians right now are feeling extremely isolated and just left in the lurch. I mean, this new bill is literally, you know, a dictator's dream in black and white. It's it's no conspiracy, which is great because it's bringing a lot of people together. People that were asleep are now like, oh wait, Dan Daniel's a bit of a problem. It's like, yeah, we're trying to tell you that. So it's actually a good thing, but. Where the heck is Scott Morrison and why is he so aloof? Yeah, look, that's a, that's a, that's a good question, Monica. And, and, and I, will, I will talk about that in a sec. But on the sort of the Victorian pandemic management bill, it's not just a, a handful of, of, of sort of disgruntled Victorians who, who are really criticising this. This pandemic bill is being criticised by mainstream uh, legal organisations like the Victorian Bar Association, mm -hmm. uh, who have said, quote, this bill may allow the Victorian government effectively to rule the state of Victoria by decree for the foreseeable future without, paper, without proper parliamentary oversight or checks and balance, balances. Mm -hmm. So it, it is very mainstream constitutional expertise sort of opinion criticising this. But on Scott Morrison, and I would also say Dominic Perrottet, very early on, I was actually really happy with Scott Morrison and all this sort of early in 2020, I was thinking mm -hmm. Scott Morrison was doing the right thing because you had a lot of people in Australia, public commentators and others saying, we need to shut down the schools, we need to shut down the schools. And, and ScoMo said, well, wait a second, um, the health experts are not saying that we need to shut down the schools. So why would we shut down the schools? And, and, and also Scott Morrison said, uh, on, a lot of people sort of said, oh, yeah, everyone should be uh, put in lockdown. No one should be going to work except, you know, essential workers. And Scott Morrison said, you know something, everyone who has a job and supports a family is an essential worker. So I think early on, Scott mm -hmm. Morrison, I really liked him. The, I, I think what we've learned, though, is that, the, again, the, sort of the forces that sort of lurk behind our, our, our elected representatives are incredibly powerful. And that, in, that includes the public bureaucracy. And when you have a public health bureaucracy, which basically comes to want COVID zero, which uh, basically comes to see this as a national health emergency uh, that can only be addressed through incredibly incredibly draconian lockdown laws and, and mandates. And also when that sort of sentiment starts to grip massive portions of the population, which it has, you start to see the limitations of sort of the individual and their personality in politics. And, and that's not to say that, that Scott Morrison uh, you know, is brilliant and really, really wants to do the right thing. But I, I think what we're seeing is that this is much bigger than Scott Morrison. It's much bigger than Dominic Perrottet. And, and you might actually find that deep down, these people would rather not see things going the way they are, but the bureaucratic forces behind them, and maybe even some of the, the economic forces feeding into party politics, I don't know, are so big and so powerful that these individuals find themselves in as positions in positions that little more than, than puppets of yeah. something else that, that's going on. So that, that that's probably uh, how I would analyze it. And, and look, and the sad thing is, Monica, is that just yesterday I was looking at various sort of surveys in, in particular industries, and there look there is a strong appetite among Australians for for workplace vaccine mandates. I mean, I would love to sit here, Monica, and say to you that the overwhelming majority of Australians are against workplace vaccination mandates. It is just not true. There are a lot of Australians, maybe even a majority of Australians who want them. And, and that, that really worries mm -hmm. me. 
about Australians' readiness to be able uh, to, to basically have unnecessary laws and policy imposed on them, which cost other people their jobs. And one of the saddest things for me over the last six months, Monica, is is seeing is being contacted by many people telling me they are on the cusp of losing their job because they don't want the vaccine, um, and and. And just not seeing much of a response to that among vaccinated Australians who you would have hoped had said, look, I've worked with, with Billy, who's a school teacher, or Sally as a nurse for 10 years. You know something? They're worried about the vaccination. I'm not worried. I got the vaccine. I think it's a good thing. I think they should get it, but they don't want to get it. But they, sh they sure as heck shouldn't be losing their jobs. They are good teachers. They are good nurses. I wish I saw I sort of saw more of a, a a response to these mandates from everyday Australians who don't want to see their colleagues thrown out of their jobs. But I don't know that I'm I'm really seeing mm. that. Am, am I wrong about that, Monica? That's a tough one because I think again, it's the propaganda of the mainstream media saying that this is the only ticket to freedom. Um, so I reckon if you did a survey, and I would like to do this one day, if you did a survey with a hundred thousand people. Who, has, who have been double vaccinated and ask them why they got vaccinated, I bet you maybe five or 10% of them will say it's to protect them from COVID. The other 90%, if they would admit it, is actually because they don't think they can live a normal life without it. Um, no one I have ever asked um, has gotten it for health. It's all about um, living their lives. And to me, that shows that it's actually the coercion that's given people the opinions that they have, not actually the health facts. Because if they had the health facts, of 0.004% of, of people under 20 dying from COVID, then why would anyone get, why would anyone that age get the vaccine? They're only getting it because they want to go to pubs and they want to go to cafes with their friends. So it's really hard to know what people actually think. And then once they take the vaccine against their will, if it is against their will, then I feel like psychologically, they kind of have to back it up by, by backing up the position of the government, which is a segregation, a segregated society. And in, in the past, you would know, being a historian, um, disease spreaders um, are ostracized in society. And I feel as someone who is not vaccinated myself, who can't, I can't go to a cafe. I can stand next to someone else who's double vaccinated at a cafe. I can stand up, they can sit down, I can't sit down. Um, it's really traumatic to go through that as someone who's just made a decision. And um, people seem okay with it. And it's it's very disturbing. and. Not everyone, but they just want to live their lives, yeah. uh, Stephen, you know, and, and yeah. they did it. They, they might even have a fake passport or something, but they're happy to use it. And I think that's also against the seg that's also not good because they're willing to play into the segregation as well. Yeah, I, 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 I actually agree with quite a lot of what you've just said there. Um, I, I would personally, I think. If I was, if you were to ask me, what, what's a number of people who, as a percentage, who took the vaccine because they were basically coerced to do it for fear of losing their jobs? In all honesty, I, I think it would be around minimum of sort of thirty to thirty-five percent. And coercion exists in degrees. So I, I do actually think a lot of people got it purely for their health or you know to, to do the right thing. But I also think that there was a very large minority of people who were strongly uh, coerced into doing it. And people often say to me, oh, Steve, no one's, co no one's coerced, no one's forced to take it. But no, I'm sorry. When, when your employer or your industry or the government says, you are not going to have a livelihood. You are not going to be able to pay your mortgage. You are not going to be able to support your family unless you get this vaccine. I'm sorry, but short of strapping someone into a chair and shoving a needle in their arm, that is as coercive as it gets. And so I do actually think, yeah, many Australians only got it uh, because they were coerced into getting it. But the other, the other problem is, and I've seen this firsthand, I've known people who, were, who didn't want the vaccination. And again, I don't comment on whether their reasons are, are right or not. I, I'm not a, an expert on vaccinations or anything like that. I think about this from a social political point of view. But they were dead against getting it. They put it off, they put it off, they put it off. Then they realized they can't do anything anymore. Um, they can't do the volunteer work they were doing. They, they're not going to be able to work. They can't go out. And so they get double vaxxed. And what happens after that is they just stop caring. 
they just stop caring about the whole thing because they're okay now. And then they just think to themselves, well, you know, they should just get, people should just get vaccinated. So I've seen a lot of that. And, and, and maybe that's something that, that policymakers counted on, that if you coerce people, if, if you coerce, you know, enough people to get it, then what, what happens is those people who are coerced, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them just become apathetic after that. And that's yeah. probably what's happened. And maybe they become even stronger about the vaccination because they've kind of lost a bit of their dignity in some way. Now, I'm not saying that was a wrong decision. It's just it's just the fact. Well, um, it's it's been a really great conversation. I almost forgot I was in an interview for a while. So that was great. Um, is there any lasting comments that you'd like to say to the audience before we go? I, I guess one thing I would want to say to people out there is that I think there are a lot of people out there that are, that are, that are looking around at what's going on in Australia and, and, and they're really, really concerned about it. And, but a lot of their friends are sort of saying there's nothing to worry about. And, and some of their friends might even be saying you're, you're crazy um, and, and you might even be holding back progress and, 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 and it's leading to people dying. I just want to say to those people who are starting to think they're just they're, they're crazy or they're irrational or something like that, when they look around at these vaccine mandates, when they think about the lockdowns, when they look at the draconian laws that have been introduced, not just in, in Victoria, but frankly, here in New South Wales as well, and in WA and in Queensland, I would want to say to those people, you are not crazy, that in actual fact, your concerns are very well founded. And I agree with your concerns about the social political aspect of what is going on. You are not crazy. The final thing I just want to say in terms of housekeeping is that I mentioned some statistics earlier on. Uh, I got those. Uh, those statistics are from the, the Government Department of Health website. Uh, and they were published in the Spectator Australia on the 8th of November, put together by Luke Massey. So if you want to access those statistics and more statistics uh, from the Government Department of Health, go to the Spectator Australia website uh, and the article published by Luke Massey on the 8th of November. I think it's entitled uh, Just the Facts. OK, thank you. Sounds like a really great article. Well, thank you so much, um, Stephen, and uh, hope to talk to you later because I know you've got a lot more to say. So thanks so much for your time. I, I really appreciate it, Monica, and thanks for the work that you're doing.